Good morning and happy Sabbath. We are so glad that you are all here today. We just want to extend a very special welcome to all of our visitors, those of you who are visiting us for maybe the first time, or if it's not your first time, we technically, I think, count you as family now, but we still want to give you a very special welcome. Also, to those of you watching online, welcome, and we're glad that you can join us for church today. Let's raise our voices in praise as we sing to God, and we're going to sing number two all creatures of our God and King. Let's go ahead and stand together while we sing this beautiful song together. Father, we adore you. I know you're far away. If we speak in distances and meters and kilometers, but you're so powerful that you are inside of us. At some point, you possess us. And your Holy Spirit got inside of us and changed our lives, and we thank you so much for it. And Father, we just come this Sabbath from far away or nearby, but we come we came for the purpose of worshiping you. We love you. We want to show you that we love you. Please receive our adoration this morning. Bless everybody that has a participation in the service, but also sitting in the bleachers and the people that are watching on 
live stream or television. Bless us all. And thank you so much for saving us and give us a chance to be with you for eternity. It's in your name that we pray. Amen. Amen. Seventh-day Adventist Church. Here's the events that are just ahead. Just as our bodies need food, so our souls need the Word of God. Join us Wednesday night, 7 p.m. for a midweek discipleship study. That's this Wednesday at 7 p.m. here in the church. Immediately following the service today, a fellowship meal will be provided. We encourage you all to stay and enjoy some fellowship and healthy food. Our Health Connection event for the month of July will take place this Tuesday, July 19 at 6 p.m. here at the church. This will be a movie night featuring Plant Pure Nation. Take a look. What's your healthiest meal? What? What's, do you have any health meals? Anything that's fresh? No, we don't. The culture in America is that everything revolves around food and unhealthy food. The health care cost trajectory is out of control because the consumers are not in charge. This is clearly an unsustainable trend. We're not telling people how to use food. Red meat, Beef. green beans with bacon and butter. When we talk about this idea of plant-based nutrition. It's a powerful concept, and it's one that my father is associated with. Dr. Colin Campbell, doc. Whole foods, plants-based diet. Right. You don't mean the store. No. <laughs> I went on essentially a plant-based diet. No dairy, no meat. Type 2 diabetes, heart disease, hypertension. <laughs> Gone. Physicians don't know how to prescribe a diet. We've been taught how to write prescriptions. Right now, this information isn't available to them. So how can they make a decision? We're working our way into the political process here. The absence of meat as part of your diet is not the best direction for all Kentuckians. you got to realize that there's a lot of big money interest. But the amendment itself is flat out true. We're trying to demonstrate this concept in this community. We offer 10 days of food. I've been testing for 26 years, and I've never seen results like this. Mr. Speaker, I call for a vote. The folks that are challenging this, they represent big business. Well, the truth is a stubborn thing. It doesn't go away. The documentary, Plant Pure Nation, explores scientific evidence. In any movement, the first step is always the hardest. Your total cholesterol is 150. Is that accurate? Yep. When people learn about this, the very next question they ask, yes. why haven't I heard this before? Why? Because revolutions can't start without awareness. Back when I started in this, there were three farmer's markets, now there's about 20. The amount of money that we spend to create the kind of health situation we have, it's not working. This is going to be a lifestyle. Our thesis is that we've got to change this world from the bottom up. That's this Tuesday, July 19 at 6 p.m. here at the church. Hope to see you there. Once again, LRSDA is teaming up with Arkansas Blood Institute for a blood drive July 21 from 2 to 5.30 p.m. here at the church. Little Rock Adventist Academy registration will take place on July 31 from 2 to 6 p.m. Parents and families are encouraged to prioritize education that emphasizes Christ-centered morals, a school that teaches, affirms, and builds a firm foundation for young minds. Little Rock Adventist Academy boasts a strong curriculum, a robust robotics department. This is a place where your children matter. They matter most spiritually, academically, mentally, physically. 
help your children build a better tomorrow, a place where they can create a deep relationship with their best friend Jesus and where academics and creativity are honored. Call Ms. Joyce Fortner at 501-412-6734. A special thanks to each of you for your faithful generosity and giving of your tithes and offerings. Remember, you can give online or in person at AdventistGiving.org or our own church website, lrsca.org. We invite you to turn your hearts towards worship. Welcome. We have two first readings. The first is for Dr. Charles Jensen to become an elder of this church. And the second reading would, would involve transfer out and transfer in. The transfer out to Conway Church from Little Rock Church is just, uh, you, you, I'm sorry, Yeladia Keniston transferring from Little Rock Church to the Conway Church. And the transfer in would be the nearest family, that's Brian, Carolyn, Lilana and uh, Nelson to be transferred into this church. And these names will be voted on next Sabbath. Thank you. Just want to make a correction. Uh, it's 630 on Tuesday night instead of six for Plant Pure Nation. So you all invited to come and watch the movie with us. Good morning, everyone. You know, I came across a quote, and if we could put that on the screen, um, that I thought was really good, and it's something that I know we all know. It says, kind, cheerful, and encouraging words will prove more effective than most healing medicines. These will bring courage to the heart of the desponding and discouraged, and the happiness and sunshine Encouraging words will repay the effort tenfold. Don't you see that in your homes when you say kind words? This quote is from Adventist Home. When we do encouraging things for other people, this is better than medicine to them. This is healing to their soul and to their spirit. And last Sabbath, we had an opportunity. We had a card outreach. And I know many of you were here. You can go ahead and advance that. Uh, many of you stayed by and helped. What we did is we had a list, several lists, many lists of names of people who have not been here for some time. Some are, can't come because they're sick and shut in and others uh, we just haven't seen in a while. And so this was our opportunity as a collective group to sit down and write cards to these people, encouraging words that we miss them, we would love to see them back. And I think we had a good time. Those of you that were here, did you enjoy doing that together? It was fun. And you can see here on the screen, we even had little ones involved. They were putting stickers on the cards and they were coloring pictures and, and they were very involved. And you know, what a blessing that we can come together as a church and do these outreach ministries. And here you see the basket of cards that were mailed. And I don't know how many went out. Uh, I know there was close to 190 pe people we were writing cards to. And I don't know how many actual cards that were sent out. But um, we prayed over those cards in that basket that they would touch the hearts of the people. And, you know, I met someone this week that received one of those cards. And it seemed to really, they seemed to really appreciate it. And they said they kept the card. And so I want to encourage you, this is something you can do. If someone is missing from church a week or two, give them a phone call. Uh, send them a card. We missed you. Is there anything we can do? Now, our next outreach will be August 20. That's a Sabbath. What we want to plan to do is to have a uh, corporate outreach 
every third Sabbath. We have fellowship lunch typically, and so we'd like to try and get in a routine of every third Sabbath, that will be our outreach. We come, after worship service we eat, and then we can go together on outreach. So put it on your calendar, and we look forward to seeing you here for that. But in the meantime, keep reaching out to those around you. Thank you. Okay, we're going to now have our children's story by our brother Chris Simons, and he brought his family with him, so let's say amen to them. We're going to have the young people to come, and to, we're going to do something differently today. If you can sit on the front row, because we'll have brother Simons up on the piano bench, and he's going to, um, if parents, um, he will like for the children, if it's okay with you, if you don't think so, look at your child and say, don't do it, but if you're okay for your child to pet the dog at the end, they can. If you don't feel that way, come and tell your children, don't do it. All right. All right. Good morning. Oh. My name's Chris, and this is Laddie. And I'm legally blind, and this is my seeing eye dog. He helps me, he helps me get around, he helps me maneuver. Okay, so he's my service dog. Okay, so if you ever see a service animal, you don't just walk up and start petting it. You go and ask the person before you start petting it. So would you guys like to, because he's not working right now, right? I'm not walking around. So would you guys like to pet him? Yeah. I heard a couple of yeses. Okay. Wait, wait, wait. No, no. Oh, we got one volunteer. <laughs> Dr. Richardson, would you help maybe a couple at a time? Okay. Okay. Here we go. Now, as I mentioned, he helps me. He helps me uh, walk around. Okay, and he's helped me several times, like right over here at this uh, traffic light. He doesn't know how to tell if the traffic light goes red or green. He's not trained in that. I'm trained in that. I'm trained in traffic flow. He's trained in danger okay so he can tell whether or not a car is coming and several times just up here at this traffic light he's been able to tell that a car is going to cut me off and he stepped in front of me and one time it's been an electric car which i couldn't even hear and he stepped in front of me and caused me to stop and then other times he will step in front of me when there's a big hole in the sidewalk or cracks he'll have me walk around them and he'll slow down when there's treacherous uh, terrain so he helps me to walk around and it laddie was trained from when he was six months old until almost two years old and then i trained with him for about three and a half weeks, and then we took our final exam in New York City, downtown. And if he can walk there with me, he can walk anywhere. So is Laddie a big dog or a small dog? Big dog. Big dog. That's what I tell people is he has to be able to stop trucks. OK? So he's a big dog, and I had to learn to trust him. That's why I spent three and a half weeks, and he's almost nine years old, been with me almost seven years. Now, right over here is one of my beautiful granddaughters, Danilan, and she has with her her, her two-month-old Pomeranian Yorkie mix puppy 
which she's going to bring around to you guys to see. And this is Moo. Is Moo a big dog or a little dog? Little dog. Do you think that Moo can do Laddie's job? No, I'd probably trip over Moo Moo. I don't think that I don't think Moo Moo would fit in this harness that Laddie has even. So and I I I wouldn't I don't think that I could trust Moo Moo the way that I can trust Laddie. So do we serve a big God or a little God? Big God, that's right. Psalm 139 says that I go to the highest heavens and he's there. And I go to the lowest depths of the sea and he's there. And I know that because I served in submarines in the Navy. But that's a different story for a different time. Okay, so little dogs, okay. Little God, not so much. Okay, and we have to learn to trust God to keep us from danger, like Laddie, I learned to trust him, and he can see things that I can't see, and God can see things that I can't see, right? All righty, amen. Anyone want to say a prayer for us? Yes, I can't see if they... I think you find this rather interesting. Brother, tell them right fast how you found out about this church. So um, they were, uh, the veterans were doing a construction project, and I lived just across the street, and a brother came over there to do a bid and uh, tells me, uh, yeah, I, I go to the church just right over there. And uh, I was like, really? I, I've been looking for a new church. So he's like, well, come on down. And, and that was Lee Ross. So I've been coming here ever since, and here we go. So at any rate, if someone wants to say a prayer, oh, oh yeah, and if you guys ever want to uh, um, ever run into me, um, feel free to say hi and tell me who you are. Because Laddie won't tell me who you are. <laughs> Remember, that's not in his job description. <laughs> okay. <laughs> and I can't see well enough to know who you are. And feel free to ask me to pet him. I'll probably say yes. Okay. So anyone want to say a prayer? Now they're quiet. <laughs> okay. Now they're quiet. Dear Jesus, thank you thanks for my dying, hope, and Moses, and my shepherd, Jesus, and Amen. Amen. I saw another hand, didn't I? You want to do it? Okay. Dear Father in heaven, thank you for the day. Thank you for loving us, trusting us, and protecting us. And thank you for being so good and this awesome God. In Jesus' name, amen. 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 Thank you, brother. Thank you, sister. Thank you, young people. morning and happy Sabbath. This is a very uh, special and hands-on time in our worship service where we have the opportunity to thank God for his, for his faithfulness to us. Recently, I, I had the opportunity to listen to a lecture on the importance of financial stewardship. It was a lecture I was not prepared for. Um, 
I remember one of the takeaway points that hit me that just really was very profound to me was that our, our financial giving is not to be an impulsive act, but rather a structured and intentional commitment, an act of worship to God. Not because God needs our money, because Psalms 50 tells us that he owns a cattle on a thousand hills and every animal in the forest is his. And Brother Samus tells us in Psalms 139, we serve a big God. <laughs> so he doesn't need our money. But he calls us to consistent and a persistent act of worship, gratitude and selflessness that allows us to actively combat our own sinful nature. I'm sure I'm the only one that looks around and sees inflation, gas prices, real estate, stocks, doing crazy things. The prices of Big Frank's going up. <laughs> I'm probably the only one that has anxiety over finances and being faithful in our giving to God. But God gives us this promise in Mark, uh, Malachi 3.10, referencing tithe. Test me in this. See if I will not then open the windows of heaven and pour out blessings for you until there is no need. We serve a faithful God. In this time of anxiety, panic, and uncertainty, it's very easy to feel and to think that we cannot afford to be faithful in our tithes and offerings. But scripture tells us that we can't afford not to be faithful in our tithes and offerings. The offering of Sabbath is for uh, the church budget. And may the deacons please stand. Come forward. Dear Heavenly Father, thank you for giving us everything. Thank you for your consistent uh, faithfulness and blessings to uh, for us. Lord, we thank you for the opportunity to give back to you, and I pray that you will help us to look beyond the fears of this earth, to look beyond our own anxiety, and trust you and give faithfully to you. In your name we pray, amen. Let's go ahead and stand again together as we sing, Pass Me Not, O Gentle Savior. Thankfully, we don't ever have to worry about God forsaking us, right? He never passes us when we need him, which is always. So we can thank him for that today. Number 569, Pass Me Not, O Gentle Savior. Savior, hear my humble cry. While on others thou art calling, do not pass me by. Savior, Savior.
blessing that we have a savior we can rely on amen that will never pass us by and if we are faithful to him we have something else we can look forward to as well what a beautiful day that will be when we all get to heaven and i love hearing you sing so sing loud let's sing it like we mean it we have a blessed hope that we are looking forward to don't we amen. when we all get to heaven this is like a march energy Sing the wondrous love of Jesus, sing His mercy and His grace. In the mansions, bright and blessed, He'll prepare all for you. When we all get to heaven, what a day of rejoicing that will be. When we all see Jesus. We'll sing and shout the victory. While we walk the pilgrim pathway, clouds will overspread the skies. But when traveling days are over, not a shadow, not a siren. When we all get to heaven, what a day. And I will be when we all see Jesus, we'll sing and shout the victory. Let us then be true and faithful, trusting, serving every day. Just one glimpse of Him in glory will the toils of life repay. And I will be when we all see Jesus, we'll sing and shout the victory. Onward to the prize before us, soon his beauty will be whole. Soon the pearly gates will open, we shall tread the streets of gold. When we all get to heaven, what a day of rejoicing that will be. When we all see Jesus, we'll sing and shout. 
face to face when we have a chance to shake his hand. Good morning and happy Sabbath church. It is our time now where we get to, to talk to God as a church and uh, bring our, our prayers and our, 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 our prayer requests and our thanks to him. And uh, if anybody has any special requests or any special thanks, please feel free to come forward and kneel. And if you have an opportunity to kneel where you're at, you're, feel free to do that. Or if not, we can stay seated. I will kneel as we, as we come to God in prayer. Dear Heavenly Father, Lord, we come to you this morning. We thank you for all your blessings of another Sabbath day that you brought us all together on. Lord, we know that uh, life here on this earth sometimes is discouraging, and we've all been through a week that in some way or another has had its challenges. We see the effects of sin all around us, Lord, and we know that um, your, this time can't be much longer before, Lord, this earth uh, can continue like this. And so, Lord, we... Thank you for the blessing of being able to come together now as a church family to worship, to acknowledge who, you as our Savior and as our God, and to acknowledge the promises that you've given us, Lord, that you're coming soon to take us home and to end the misery and the suffering that's all around us. Lord, we thank you today for this building that we get to worship in, for the freedom that we get to come here in, and, and the peace that, we're, that we have in this church. And Lord, we ask you to help us use this opportunity lord to come together as a church family as this group to do a great work for you in telling those around us here in this little rock area about your great promise and and, the, and your soon return lord, we ask you today especially to be with pastor hinkle as he brings us your message thank you for the encouragement that his messages have been and help us to allow your holy spirit to work in our hearts to draw us closer to you and to use that prompting to change our lives in a way that is pleasing to you. And thank you once again for all your blessings. Be with each prayer request and each thanks that's out here. And you know each and every one of our hearts. And uh, help us to trust you and have faith and that you will work out what's best for us in our lives. All this we ask in Jesus' name. Amen. Okay, good morning everybody. Today we'll be today uh today I will be reading Philippians today I'll be reading Philippians four, um, six and seven. Be anxious for nothing, but in everything by prayer and supplication, with thanksgiving, let your requests be made known to God, and the peace of God will surpass all understanding. Regard your hearts and minds to Christ Jesus. Thing from here is because when I went to the church for the very first time in Las Vegas, I was a young man. Well, I was like 20. That's young. <laughs> and I used to do things that parents don't like guys to do. And we have teenagers here, and they have struggles, and I have struggles myself. And I went to church, and I had a chance to be next to the piano. And it sounded lovely. Because in the Catholic church where I grew up, you don't do anything. You just watch <laughs> and listen. You, have, you don't dare go close to the organ. 
So Tony, when he plays the piano and the organ, I love it because I'll, I feel more connected. But today we're going to sing something that is in there. What does it say in there? Musica especial. It's okay, you can say it. If I, if I can say special music, you can say musica especial. Spanish is so easy to read because your brain will tell you how to pronounce it. You don't have to fake it. It's musica especial. So we're going to sing a song in Espanol. I'm going to do the Spanish version. But my friend Moy sent me something that is so true because there are some things in life that are better to do it in your own language. If you speak more than one, of course. It's about money. If you want to go see a doctor, it's better to do it in your own language, right? If you're speaking about love, it's better to do it in your own language. But when you talk to God, what do you think? It's better to do it in your own language. It's very deep spiritual in intimacy between you and God. So I'm going to sing today in Espanol a song that you will do in English. In the hymnal it says 470. You can follow. Open your hymnals. I'm going to sing it in Espanol. <laughs> Okay, Moses wrote to me, there is no better way to feel spiritually connected as when you worship God in your own language. It's so true, right? So I'm going to sing a song that is in 470. And you, you know, I'm sure you know it in English. 470, you can follow the words. Gran gozo hay en mi alma hoy, Jesús conmigo está. Contento con su amor estoy, su dulce paz me da. Brilla el sol de Cristo en mi alma. Cada día voy feliz así, su faz sonriente al contemplar cuánto gozo siento en mí, en mi alma y melodía soy, canciones a mi rey, feliz y libre en Cristo soy. Y salvo por la fe, brilla el sol de Cristo en mi alma. Cada día voy feliz así, su paz sonriente al contemplar cuánto gozo siento en mí. Sounds good. I can roll my heart now. I'm sorry, I'm sorry. That's okay. It's a special. In the alma y melodía soy, canciones a mi rey. Feliz y libre en Cristo soy y salvo por el fe. Brilla el sol de Cristo en mi alma. Cada día voy feliz así, su faz sonriente al contemplar cuánto gozo siento en mí. Gracias, God. Happy Sabbath, everyone. It's a blessing to be together. I pray that there is sunshine in our souls. And this morning, we have multiple reasons to be thankful. I appreciated the children's story. We have a big God, amen? And our God, we can trust him. 
Uh, we also have the opportunity to study in his word. And this afternoon, we have a meal together. That's fellowship. That's incredible. But we also have someone who's committing their life to Jesus once again. Sister Barbara Osborne is going to be baptized. You don't want to miss it. I can tell you, if you were choosing between coming to church or coming to the baptism, you should have come to the baptism. Okay, so you still have opportunity to do that. If you showed up at church, that's great, but you really need to be at the baptism. It's going to be incredible, and I really mean that. Because how many of you believe that an encounter with Christ is beautiful? And when you can hear how the Lord has led all throughout the years, it inspires our hearts. You don't want to miss it. The Bible tells us the people in Revelation overcame the devil by the word of God, or by the blood of the Lamb, and by the word of their testimony. We're going to hear Sister Barbara's testimony, and we're going to be excited to see how God leads. Amen? And so come to support, but why don't we take some time now as we get ready to open the Word of God to ask the Spirit of God to open our hearts and minds. Amen? We want the Spirit to speak to us, and He's willing, but let's ask Him. Let's pray together as we get started. Father in heaven, Lord, we thank you for the privilege of coming together as your people. Father, thank you for this opportunity to study your Word. And Lord, as we think, as Charles was talking about in the offering appeal, all of the things that are going on around us that can cause us distress, Father, you desire for us to have perfect peace. Father, we want that. We want to experience it. Even if we've never had it before, we pray that you would, by the divine power of your Spirit, help us to understand how it can become ours today. Lord, we just ask that as your Word ministers to us, we'd be open, that your Spirit would speak to us so clearly that we could hear your voice. In Christ's name we pray, amen. Well, this morning we're going to be studying Philippians chapter 4. For the last th two weeks, we've been looking at the book of Philippians. Philippians chapter 3 is where we were observing or spending some time. And this morning we're going to be looking at Philippians chapter 4. We've recognized more than any other book, the book of Philippians calls God's people to be happy. And not just happy, but simply to rejoice in the... Lord. Do you remember looking at that? Several passages that we saw, Paul says over eight times, rejoice in the Lord, and here's the, they're laid out there on the screen so you can review them. And as Paul is talking about rejoicing and happiness, we have to remember that Paul was in a situation that most people would be very unhappy in. And where was that? Paul was in prison. And he was imprisoned in Rome. I don't know what you know about the Romans, but I remember that it was those Romans who actually crucified Christ. And some say, well, it might not have been a Rome, it might have been another place, but what we understand is regardless of where you're imprisoned, being in prison is not a place that people usually rejoice or causes them to rejoice. We also read in 1 Corinthians how Paul said that there had been many things that had happened in his life. Do you remember reading that spiritual resume, so to speak? He had talked about how he was beaten 40 lashes minus one multiple times. He was shipwrecked. He was stoned. He had all of the challenges of this earth, and yet he says to rejoice in the Lord. And my friends, do you think there could be some divine principles for us to learn how we can rejoice in God? We've taken a little bit of time to look through it over the last couple of weeks, and we're not going to review that this morning, but we're going to look at Philippians chapter 4, how can we rejoice when we're feeling anxious? Have any of you ever felt anxious? You ever had your spirit troubled and you've been something less than peaceful? How is it that we can experience joy in these situations? Now, Philippians chapter 4, verses 1 through 3, introduce us to something that's going on in the church of Philippi, and it's something that in most churches would greatly disturb the people, and my guess is you've actually experienced this in your life at one time or another. And notice what Paul says was going on. Philippians chapter 4 and verse 1, he says, Therefore, my beloved, and longed for brethren, my joy and crown. So stand fast in the Lord, beloved. But notice what he says in verse 2. I implore Judea, and I implore Syntyche, to be of the same what? Okay, let me ask you a question. Why do you think Paul is calling out two people by name? He's asking them to be of the same mind. If someone is telling you that you two need to have the same mind, what's really going on in your experience together? 
you're not of the same mind. Well, this is, I really appreciate that. This is simple to understand, isn't it? There's disunity going on. Isn't that what we would call it? If you're not on the same wavelength, or you're not on the same trajectory, you realize that there's discord among you. Well, verse 3, he says, And I urge you also, true companion, help these women who labored with me in the gospel, with Clement also and the rest of my fellow workers, whose names are in the book of life. So the people in Philippi have some interpersonal relationship issues. They're arguing. There's discord. There's disagreement. And how many of you have ever been in a disagreement with someone? Any of you? I mean, it's not because you were wrong. It's because they were wrong, right? We understand that, but I'm just asking, have you ever been in a disagreement? What we realize when you're in a situation where there's two people who are in, who have tension, it creates anxiety. Every, anyone ever been in that situation before? And what Paul here, as he, we just finished looking at chapter 3, where he encourages these people to rejoice in the Lord over and over and over again. He's about to do it again in verse 4 of chapter 4. But he realizes there's a tangible challenge that would keep people from rejoicing in the Lord, or at least they would think so. And that tangible challenge is, how can I rejoice when so-and-so makes me angry? How can I rejoice when I feel anxious or I, I don't appreciate them? There's disunity. How is it possible to rejoice in that situation? My friends, have you ever felt like situations on this earth have stolen away your joy in the Lord? Maybe it's not discord, maybe it's something else. Maybe it's financial challenges. Maybe you're in discord with your employer because they're not paying you enough. Whatever it is, you've had these challenges that feel like they rob your peace. But what's interesting, right after Paul describes this experience of these two women, and I would guess there's a few others who he's calling to come together, he then says something that to me sounds out of place. Philippians chapter four, verses four and five, notice what he says. Rejoice in the Lord always. Again, I will say rejoice. Now, how many of you have ever counseled some of your friends who they talk about the disunity going on and the next thing you say is just rejoice? I mean, really? <laughs> no, I, you just told me that we're at odds with each other and now you're telling me I should rejoice. How is it possible to rejoice when difficulties come? Well, let me ask you a question. Did Paul give us any understanding of how we can rejoice even in difficult times in chapter 3? What did Paul talk about were some of the reasons for rejoicing? If you remember back, Paul says in Philippians chapter 3 and verse 3 that you should rejoice in the Lord and he was going to tell you because for you it was safe. Do you remember reading that? Paul says, look, I want you to remember, you need to rejoice in the Lord even in the midst of your disunity because it's for your own mental safety. For those of you who didn't hear that message, you can go back and reread those passages. But then he goes on and he reminds the people that he was rejoicing because he did not have confidence in his own flesh, but he had confidence in God's ability. My friends, what about, are there insurmountable challenges in your life that seem impossible for you to figure out? But could it be the reason why we're anxious about those things, financial issues, interpersonal issues, job issues, whatever it might be, we're anxious because we think we need to fix them. But what if we had no confidence in the flesh? In other words, think about ourselves in the light of who we are. The psalmist says that we are but dust. Do you look at the dust and go to it to figure out your problems? Well, let's be humble for a second. That's who we are. Now, we're the most loved dust of God, but the reality is, is we're but dust. We can't have confidence in the flesh, so when something comes that's trying and challenging, if we hold the burden upon ourselves and say, I'd better figure this out, you will have no ability to rejoice, but if in the midst of challenges, you can turn your eyes heavenward and realize, okay, it's for my safety, I know that I need this for my mind, my confidence is not in myself, so I'm going to rejoice in the Lord, and sometimes I need to be told twice because it's so difficult, and again I say, rejoice. You see, Paul understood that rejoicing 
was essential for the Christian. But then he says something in verse 5 that to me, I had to read it over and over again, and it seemed almost like this disconnected proverb to the understanding of what Paul was describing. But notice what he says. Philippians chapter 4 and verse 5, he just calls the people to rejoice, and then he says, let your gentleness be known to all men, all men, the Lord is at hand. Now let's process this. Why do you think Paul wrote to them, let your gentleness be known to all men? How many of you have had a challenge in your life that's brought you anxiety? We realize this is the context of chapter four. And then when someone else comes into your experience, you are sometimes less than gentle with them when you're anxious. You ever experienced that before? But what we recognize here is Paul says, When you rejoice in the Lord, the fruit of it is that you become gentle towards others. Because if you're not having confidence in the flesh, in other words, you assess yourself and realize that you're incapable of doing certain things, does that change the way you treat others? If I'm incapable of doing what's right, maybe they are as well, and maybe we both should trust in the Lord, and instead of being frustrated with you, because I can't stand it every time you do that to me, I can simply be gentle because rejoicing in the Lord has a experience not just vertically with our connection with God but it affects people horizontally in how we relate to that but it's interesting the reasoning given here I mean here's here's how I'm thinking if I'm receiving the letter of the book of Philippians and Paul points out the challenge and he says there's this issue he tells me to rejoice and then he says let your gentleness be known to all man my thought is how can I be gentle when I'm irritated Anyone else? But it's almost like Paul gives the reasoning how we can experience this gentleness. In the midst of your anxiety, in the midst of a difficult situation, he doesn't go on a long theological discourse, but he just says it in a few words. He says, let your gentleness be known to all men. The Lord is what? The Lord is at hand. Anyone have a different translation of that same passage? Mine translates it, the Lord is at hand. Anyone else have something different? The Lord is coming soon. soon. Okay, anyone else? What else do you have? The Lord is near is another way that you could translate that very same word. So let's think about it this way. You have a challenge with a brother or a sister, with an employer, with whatever the stressor of life is, and you think that it's hard to be gentle towards others because you are stressed out. Ever been in that scenario before? But then Paul says the reason why we can be gentle is because we can remember that the Lord is near to us. Does that make a difference in our experience? My friends, when you have something overwhelming or you feel wronged by someone else or you feel like there's a challenge that's just so large you can't face it, what would happen if we simply reminded ourselves that the Lord is near me? The Lord's with me. I mean, David wrote about this. The Lord is my shepherd, I shall not want. His experience realizing that God was with him, he says, even though I go through the valley of the shadow of death, I shall fear no evil. Why? Because you are with me. The experience of understanding that God is with us or near us will transform our life when we go through difficult scenarios. Turn with me to Isaiah chapter 41 for just a moment. Isaiah chapter 41. There's a beautiful explanation of God being near us. Isaiah chapter 41, beginning in verse 10. I don't know about you, but sometimes when I go through challenging experiences, it's very easy for me just to ruminate on those things. Anyone else in the same boat? You have a situation you need to solve, so your mind is fixated on it, and you're constantly going over and over and over it. But would it be a little bit better for us to maybe dwell upon the greatness and the the nearness of the Lord to us instead of dwelling upon the challenge that we're facing? All throughout Scripture, we see the Bible writers doing this. In Isaiah chapter 41 and verse 10, this is a verse that is very special to me, but I'll save that story for just a second. Notice what it says in Isaiah chapter 41 and verse 10. The Bible says, fear not, why? For I am with you. Do not be dismayed, for I am your God. 
I will strengthen you. Yes, I will help you. I will uphold you with my righteous what? My friends, isn't that a powerful passage? Do not fear. Don't be afraid. Don't be anxious. And the sum total, the reason why we can have that experience is because I am with you. Now, can I let you into a secret on one of the greatest anxieties I've ever faced in my life? This is 100% serious, so don't, don't think I'm joking with you. My greatest anxiety in life has always been public speaking. Hands down, 100%. I'm an introvert, don't like speaking in front of others. And I remember the very first time I was coerced into speaking publicly was in Malawi, Africa. And long story short is someone didn't show up to preach a series of meetings and I had tremendous anxiety about the thought when they came and said, would you be willing to preach? And I said, no. And he said, would you pray about it? And I said, no. And he said, would you pray that the Lord would make you willing? I said, yes. And he said, well, we know that the Lord will do it, so you're going to preach. <laughs> that guy should be a car salesman, right? <laughs> no, he's a minister. That's his right calling. And I remember agreeing to preach. And this was a verse that was shared with me when I showed up to my site and there were 3,000 people sitting there. Now, can you imagine being an introvert who's never spoken publicly and you have 3,000 people there and someone says, read a Bible passage. Which one? Isaiah chapter 41 and verse 10. And I went to it. And have you ever been in such a difficult situation you have no choice but to cling to whatever hope you find? <laughs> well, that's where I was. And I read this passage. Fear not, for I am with you. Do not be, what does it mean, dismayed? Don't be, how many of you would be troubled if someone told you in five minutes from now you're speaking to 3,000 people? Okay, some of you can relate to me. Others of you think that's a great experience. God bless you. Do not be dismayed. Why? He doesn't say because you're great, because you know how to fix the problem, because you're smart enough. Don't be worried. Why? For I'm your God. It's almost like God saying, I don't know how to get this through your mind, but your proximity to me is the thing that gives you assurance to overcome these challenges. I'm with you, and I want to remind you, I am your God. I'm not just the God of your parents. I'm not just the God of the Old Testament or the New Testament or the early apostolic church. I'm your God. And if I worked for them, why can I not work for you? I will strengthen you. Yes, it's like he's trying to reaffirm that, yes, this is going to be a reality. Yes, I will help you. I will uphold you with my righteous right hand. Now, you can go on for sake of time. We might save the next few verses, but over and over and over again in the next few passages in Isaiah, God explains to them how he would be their deliverer, their sustainer, their redeemer, their solution to all of the challenges that they face in life. My friends, what impact would this have if this became our reality in everyday situations? What if we were mindful that God was near to us? Would it change how we live? What if we could remember that God was with us to help us and sustain us regardless of the test you're facing? Could you make it through that time? You see, could it be, this is why Paul is saying in Philippians chapter 4, let your gentleness be known to all men. Why? Because the Lord is at hand. Now Paul continues on with his description or counsel to these people who are facing an overwhelming crisis. Philippians chapter 4 the crisis of interpersonal challenges that have even affected the church. And for any of you who have ever been to a church where there's interpersonal issues, how many of you just love coming there? Have you been there before? <laughs> I mean, some people stop going to church completely in those scenarios. And I think sometimes we can humanly say it makes sense. But in the midst of this challenge that Philippi is facing, God now gives some specific instruction. He tells them that he's near to them, but notice the instruction that he gives them in Philippians chapter 4 and verse 6. 
The people who have interpersonal challenges are called to rejoice, to remember the nearness of the Lord, and now they're told something that sounds very challenging in verse 6, be anxious for how much? Now, how many of you somewhat don't like that passage? I mean, in other words, doesn't God give any room for understandable anxiety in our lives? I mean, there's certain things that just make us anxious, right? I mean, isn't God okay with that? But this is a divine command to be anxious for zero. And I can tell you, as a person with a fear of public speaking, who the Lord had a sense of humor to make him a pastor, this is something where I've thought, isn't this a case where I can just be anxious? (laughs) I mean, I'm about to stand before people. I remember having anxiety so bad over preaching that one time when I was asked to preach at the Rio Rancho Seventh-day Adventist Church in New Mexico, I was visibly shaking. And where my mouth, my words were shaking if I tried to speak. My mouth was like visibly moving. Now, how many of you would love to see a pastor do that? (laughs) I mean, this is horrible, right? And it was so bad that I remember going into the back of the church. There was a room similar to this. And guess what I did in that back room? It would have been good to pray. Didn't think about it. I started doing push-ups because I had so much adrenaline and so much nerve. I had to wear myself down just to stop shaking. I remember when I was first married to my wife and we were pastoring churches and my favorite time of the week was at about noon on Sabbath. Because that was the furthest place I could be removed from another sermon. And I remember seriously having tremendous anxiety and it was, it was palpable in our home. And my wife one time looked at me and she said, is it always going to be like this? <laughs> and I said, I don't know. You know, I mean, I didn't design this thing. This is sincere anxiety. I don't know how to deal with it. But I can tell you that the the instruction in these passages are the things that have changed my life. That God gives us a remedy for our anxiety. So let me just give you a side note. How many of you have ever said, God isn't calling me to do X, Y, or Z because it terrifies me? Have you ever said something like that? It's wrong, okay? That might be the very thing that God's calling you to do, and he's gonna help you overcome that terror, amen? There's your side note for anyone who's struggling with that. But notice the instruction. Here God says, be anxious for nothing. But you know what I love about God? He doesn't tell us to do something without aiding us to be able to experience that that he's calling us to do. In other words, if he tells us to be anxious for nothing, he's going to help remove our anxiety. Amen? I mean, this is beautiful. Be anxious for nothing. And that next word is what? But. In other words, here's the contrast. You can either hold on to your anxiety or you can experience this next reality I'm going to tell you about. Which one do you want? I don't think there's anyone who wants to hold on to their anxiety. Do you trust that God is big enough to solve your problems? I do. And if you don't, get to know him a little bit more and I can guarantee you will. Be anxious for nothing, but here's the alternative to your anxiety. Notice what he says. But in everything, by what? prayer and supplication with thanksgiving. Let your requests be made known to God and the peace of God, which surpasses all understanding, will guard your hearts and your minds through Christ Jesus. Now it's interesting, we come back to an idea. Paul told these people in chapter three that rejoicing in the Lord was for their safety. Do you remember reading about that? We then went to Isaiah chapter 26, three that says you will keep him in perfect peace whose mind is stayed on you because they trust in you. Remember going there? And we saw that word for keep him in perfect peace really could mean to guard you. And here Paul just comes out and says that when you pray and you experience this process that he's describing, that God will give you peace that surpasses all understanding. What does it mean surpasses all understanding? You know, I really appreciate Dr. Richardson this morning. He's just breaking it down for us. He said, it surpasses all your understanding. It's like there's an echo in the room. No, I'm just, 
But the reality is, in other words, it's greater than anything you can even imagine. Is that, is that a fair translation, Dr. Richardson? I'm going to look to you from now on, all right? God's ability to relieve your anxiety through prayer is greater than you could imagine it would ever be. And he says, not only is it greater, he continues on in verse 7, and he says, it will actually guard your hearts and your minds through Christ Jesus. It's almost like the Lord puts a, a watchman over our minds when we surrender our things to him to keep that anxiety from coming back in. But I have a question. How many of you have ever prayed but still felt anxious? You ever gone through that? You know a family member's facing some tremendous health crisis and you pray, but the whole rest of the day, you're still just as anxious as before you went to prayer. Can we be honest about that? How many of you have that experience? Oftentimes, don't raise your hand, right? This is, I would say the human experience is that we pray and we say, okay, God says that if I pray, he'll take away my anxiety and he'll guard my heart and my mind, but I am still anxious. But did you know that you can pray in a way that you still retain all of your anxiety? Or you can pray in a way where all of your anxiety is relieved. And the way in which we pray, and Paul gives us the key in this passage. We don't have to go somewhere else. He gives us the key in this passage that will either allow your prayers to help you experience peace that surpasses all understanding. Or he will identify that there are prayers that allow you to retain all of your initial anxiety. So what makes the difference? Let's go back to the passage. Philippians chapter 4 and verse 6. Be anxious for nothing. Now remember, he's talking to people who already have a problem, right? But he's telling the people with the problem not to worry. Don't be anxious. But in everything, by prayer, yes, makes sense. Supplication makes sense. I ask for stuff all the time, right? But then it adds something else. With what? with thanksgiving. Do you think Paul was just trying to figure out how many words he could throw into the sentence to help, you know, help it sound real nice? You know, pray and supplicate before God. Oh, and with thanksgiving, you know, that sounds real nice. Or could it be that there's something about prayer when you're anxious that can still be thankful to God that allows your mind to be freed from anxiety? In order to be thankful to God after you pray, when you're going through a difficult time, what is required? Faith. Now, why would we say that faith is required in order to have this experience? How would we walk around this? If you come to God in prayer, and let's put, use my own example that I've already identified to you. Lord, it's Friday night, at 11 o'clock, and tomorrow morning I'm supposed to speak to 12,000 people, and I have zero message. This is a reality situation, Dallas, Texas, 2007. And I agonized with God in prayer for hours. And then I remembered that sometimes I'm anxious about what I'm saying because I'm just worried about how I look in front of other people, not about God actually receiving glory or studying the word, right? And the thought came to mind that God tells us that he makes vessels for honor and some for dishonor. <laughs> That's a really humbling thing to think about. And I remember praying and saying, Lord, I don't know what to experience tomorrow, but I believe that I can trust you and you've created honor, vessels for honor and dishonor, and you can choose tomorrow which one I become. Look, there was nowhere else to turn. I didn't have anything. I had nothing to share. And then my mind starts reflecting on some passages. Here are things that have become meaningful to me. God was able to speak through a donkey. I know we use that lightly, but really, his ability to speak is often very limited upon the ability of the individual speaking. It's upon the willingness of the individual speaking. And I started to recount the faithfulness of God to move in the hearts of men and women through his message. My word shall not return unto me, what? 
void. In other words, it will go for it and it will accomplish what I've sent it for. God promises to do what he needs to do with his people. And so I began to pray, Lord, if you, if you desire to waste 30 minutes of everyone's day tomorrow, you can do that. But I need your help. If you, would, if you would have them to be hearing something, your spirit needs to show up. And my experience changed from one of self-focus to honest communication with God, but also an experience where I could trust God. God, you can decide what happens. And I went to sleep that night, and I woke up the next morning, and the Lord gave me a message to preach. It's a miracle. I mean, I'm telling you, for me, as an introvert who's terrified of these things, that's a miracle. And God does it over and over and over and over again. But here's the challenge. Sometimes, let's use a scenario that maybe all of us can relate to. Father, I have financial issues. Any of you had those before? Father, I have financial struggles. And I don't know how X, Y, and Z is going to be paid. And we can either, that can be the sum total of our prayer... Or we can say, Lord, I thank you that you can provide. And as we were reminded this morning, God owns a cattle on a thousand hills. Amen? And so, Lord, I'm thankful that you are not limited in your ability to provide for me financially. I'm going to ask you to help me with thanksgiving. Because I believe you can. The ability to trust God when we pray is demonstrated with thanksgiving. Do you believe that? The ability to trust God is demonstrated that we have faith when we can be thankful for what we pray about. You know, Jesus makes this principle very clear elsewhere in Scripture that it could be the reason why we're anxious today is because we pray and we tell God about our problems, but we don't actually think he can resolve them. We bring the problems to him and we think they're insurmountable and then we pick those problems back up and we run back off from God and we try to figure out how to fix them. Anyone else can relate to that? But God is saying when you're anxious, you should bring those things to him in prayer. With thanksgiving, you leave them there and you say, Lord, I know that you can provide for those. That's when you can have peace that surpasses all understanding that will guard your hearts and minds through Christ Jesus. Now, James stresses the importance of faith in prayer. James chapter 1. James chapter 1. James chapter 1. Oh, you're not in James. There we are. James chapter 1, verse 5. James chapter 1 and verse 5. Notice what the Bible instructs us. If any of you lack wisdom, can anyone identify with that? Let him ask of God who gives, gives to all liberally and without reproach, and it will be given him. How many of you think that sounds like great assurance? If you are lacking wisdom, you don't know what to do, you ask God, and without fail, he will give it. But now notice the condition. Verse 6. But let him ask in faith. My friends, can you think of all the times or some of the times in your life where you've asked God for things, but it was lacking that faith? I mean, does the Spirit bring anything to our minds? Lord, I want to have a good relationship with this person, but you know how nasty they are. You know, I can't even believe that they said this to me, and they da 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 And bless them, God, amen. (laughs) Or bless their hearts, right? That's what you say in the South, forgive me. But the reality is, is that we've still retained the challenge we came to prayer with, right? Have you ever noticed the Psalms, how honest David is with his emotions sometimes? I mean, Lord, can you just cut off all my enemies? (laughs) Kill them. Uh, I mean, I'd be happy if they're all dead and didn't receive any good reward. He's honest with God. But then he also says, Lord, but I, I go into your sanctuary and I remember the end of all men. Um, In other words, God, I'm thankful that even though they might look like they're prospering here, I know there's a judgment coming. And so, God, I I trust you with these things. Whether they're cut off in this life or that life, I I pray that the trials of this earth will end, and I trust that you're going to do it. These are some of the meanings of David's deep prayers, this coming to God in resolution because he remembers that he serves a great enough God to deal with his problems. 
And James says the challenge, the difference between those who ask for something in prayer and they receive it, between those who ask for something and don't receive it is because they lack faith. Now let me give you one caveat here. I remember there was a dear sister who said that she prayed in faith for years for someone to be healed. And God did not seemingly answer that prayer with an affirmative yes. And that person died. Does that mean that she did not have enough faith that God could answer her? Did John the Baptist want deliverance from prison? Did he expect it from Jesus? So much so that he says, he tells his disciples, hey, go and ask him, are you the one or should we look for another one? But God left John the Baptist there in prison to die a martyr's death. Is it because Jesus didn't love John the Baptist? Did Jesus think his work was unimportant? Jesus calls him the greatest of all the prophets, doesn't he? Could it be sometimes that God knows what's better than us? Brother Chris, I think your children's story helps us to understand this, right? I can guarantee you if I was Chris, there'd be some times where Laddie would get in my way and I'd want... I'd want him to move because I'd want to do the thing I want to do. But could it be that God blocks or intercepts or does differently than we desire because he has vision that we do not? My friends, the faith in God is not faith that says, God, you must do what I say, but it's the faith that Daniel's three friends had in Daniel chapter 3 when they're there before King Nebuchadnezzar and he says, if you don't bow down, I'm going to burn you in that furnace. And they say, well, let's just make one thing clear. We're not going to worship it. But our God whom we serve can deliver us from your hand, O king. But what does he say after that? But even if not, we're still not doing it. God can deliver us, but he might choose not to. And we're still going to worship him. We still experience deliverance, whether I'm delivered in this life or in the next one. Faith in God is not whimsical. Sometimes we say, well, I can't pray for healing for someone because what if they don't get healed? That's not my problem. I believe God is capable of healing people of their physical maladies if they come, as God says in James, and they ask for the prayer of faith to heal the sick. God has done that, amen, even in modern times. But I have seen many people we have prayed for go to their graves. And from our perspective, that's a terrible answer. In God's perspective, he's thinking, these people have no more suffering now, and the next thing they know is eternity without sickness. Could it be our limited view sometimes keeps us from thinking we can have faith in God? My friends, God is a God who will always listen. Jesus says, ask, and it shall be given you. Now, he says, continually asking, it shall be given you. That's really the translation there in the Greek. Seeking, and you shall find. Knocking, and it will be opened to you. In other words, God asks earnest, repetitious prayers. I'm not talking about vain repetition, but earnestly entreating God and asking him. He says, that is the way for you to get an answer. I'm not a lotto machine that you come to, punch in the right numbers, pull the slot, and you get the right thing. But what I am is someone, when you persistently ask, I will always answer what's best for you. Paul says that it's this view of prayer that could keep you from experiencing anxiety. And my friends, I can tell you just from personal experience, we're all growing in this, amen? As Paul says, no one's arrived to the point of saying, look, I, have, I know how to have no anxiety whatsoever. But I'm growing in my ability to trust Jesus, amen? And I believe he wants all of us to have that experience. And could it be the one thing that's keeping us from having the peace is that we think we ourselves are dependent for fixing that problem? My friends, do you have any struggles that are insurmountable in your own mind? Maybe it's time to have no confidence in the flesh, as Paul said. But it's time for us to remember that we have a God who is as great as the heavens and as low as the depths, and his hand is not short that he cannot save. 
God desires to minister to us. And we come to him in prayer and we say, Lord Jesus, heal me. Heal me spiritually. Be with my family. Give me wisdom. Give me guidance. I need all these things. You know what the Lord says? I'll do it. I'm going to act on your behalf. It might not be immediate. You might not have any feeling or tangible experience to say, I know that God will do it. But that's where faith comes in. You know, Jesus tells a story, and I think it's for our benefit. In Mark chapter 9, Mark chapter 9 and verse 17. Mark chapter 9 and verse 17. Jesus gives us a story that maybe we can relate to this morning about someone seeking healing. Mark chapter 9 and verse 17. Jesus comes down from the Mount of Transfiguration. There's a commotion going on in the crowd. And verse 17, we're introduced to this idea. It says, then one of the crowd answers and says, teacher, I brought you my son who has a mute spirit. And whenever it seizes him, it throws him down. He foams at the mouth, gnashes his teeth, and he becomes rigid. So I spoke to your disciples that they should cast it out, but... They could not. Now, how many of you would already have some discouraged faith at that point? Verse 19, then he, being Jesus, answered him and said, O faithless generation, how long shall I be with you? How long shall I bear with you? Bring him to me. My friends, do we experience some of our problems when we try to bring them to other people to solve them instead of bringing them to Christ? Verse 20, then then they brought him to him. And when he saw him, immediately the spirit convulsed him. And he fell on the ground and wallowed, foaming at the mouth. So he asked his father, how long has this been happening to him? Now, put yourself in the shoes. How many of you have ever thought, I'm going to bring this thing to Jesus, but I'm reminded of how long this has been going on. What does the father say? From childhood. In other words... How long? A long time. Have you ever stopped to assess what God can help you with? If it's just a small struggle, maybe you can trust him with that, but what about those struggles that have been going on from childhood? Verse 22, and often he has thrown him both into the fire and into the water to destroy him. But, notice these next few words, but if you can do anything... Have compassion on us and help us. Did anything stand out to you in that man's explanation? (laughs) You know, here's the challenge that I'm facing. It's huge. I mean, this is my son who's, I mean, they're trying to destroy him. But it's been going on forever. So, I mean, I, I understand there's big problems. So, if this is something you can deal with, can you help him? What does if signify? Doubt, lack of faith, does Jesus ignore this? Now notice what happens next. Jesus says in verse 23, if you can believe, all things are possible to him who believes. In other words, Jesus identifies the thing that's keeping the experience that he's praying for from happening. If you can believe it can happen, But if you don't believe, there's no hope. And I love the words of this man and how Jesus accepts it. Verse 24, immediately the father of the child cries out and said with tears, Lord, I believe. Help my unbelief. Have you ever felt like that before? (laughs) Lord, I believe that you could deliver me from this situation. I believe that you could deliver me from this sin. I believe you could deliver me from this crisis. I believe, but help my unbelief. You know, Jesus doesn't reject this man. In verse 25, when Jesus saw that the people came running together, 
He rebuked the unclean spirit and said to it, Deaf and dumb spirit, I command you, come out of him and enter him no more. And then the spirit cried out, convulsed him greatly, and came out of him. And he became as one dead, so that many said, He is dead. But Jesus took him by the hand and lifted him up, and he arose. When Jesus sees us with our struggling faith, does he reject us? Even the cry to God, I believe, but help my unbelief, does not go unanswered before God. Jesus told us if you have grain, if you have faith as a If I brought a mustard seed here this morning and held it up, you think you'd be able to see it? If you have the most limited variation of faith, you can move the greatest obstacle that you're facing. So how does this make a difference to us today? You know, there's the song, Oh, what peace we often forfeit. Oh, what needless pain we bear, all because we do not carry everything to God in prayer. We realize that we can sometimes carry things to prayer and carry them right back with us, can't we? But how many of you say, Lord Jesus, I want to learn to really pray? I want to pray as though I believe that you are a God who is near me, you're a God who is able. You're a God who can deliver me, and even if you don't deliver me, you're a God I'm still going to worship. But my friends, you know what Jesus tells us? 1 John chapter 5, verse 14, this is the confidence that we have in him, that if we ask anything according to his will, he hears us. There is no prayer to overcome a struggle in your life I'm talking about a struggle of sin. There is no prayer to overcome a struggle of sin in your life that God turns a deaf ear to. How do you know it? Because is it God's will for you to continue shackled as a slave to sin? No. Christ came to save us from our sins. Amen? So when I reach out the hand of faith and says, Lord, I have this temptation or this struggle that I continually fall to, and I'm asking you to give me the strength and the victory to overcome. And I'm thankful for Jude 24, unto him who is able to keep you from falling and to present you faultless before that throne. Father, I believe, as Paul cried out, O wretched man that I am, who shall deliver me from this body of death? And then the answer came that it was Christ who could deliver him. Father, I want to reach out the hand of faith and ask you for that deliverance in my life. You know what the Lord does? He hears in heaven, and he answers that promise. He answers that prayer. Do you believe it? Did you know that he can not only answer that prayer, but he can actually sustain that victory? That's really where we come into the challenge, isn't it? I can tell you, when I was overcoming different struggles, smoking, drinking, whatever it might have been, It was easy to quit for about 30 seconds. But a victory that was sustained was what was challenging. Can anyone relate to that? But did you know that God can not only give you the victory, but he can keep you in that victory? It's the power of God. I'm not saying it's your own willpower. This is where Paul says that he doesn't regard the flesh, but he looks to the spirit of God. He looks to the power of God to deliver him from his anxiety, his experience, his struggle. My friends, do you think Jesus would deliver us this morning? My friends, I don't know where you're at, but I think each one of us need the deliverance of Jesus Christ. Amen? And I'm not talking about some whimsical, ethereal thing, but I'm talking about there's tangible things in our life where we know we need God to show up. Or let me rephrase that. That sounds disrespectful. There's things in our life where we need to allow God to show up. You understand the difference? Because he's near us, but we still have to give him permission to act. God gives us freedom of choice. He says, choose for yourself this day whom you'll serve. 
And Joshua says, as for me and my household, we will serve the Lord. How many of you want to reach out the hand of faith this morning and say, Lord, I might have come with burdens or challenges or difficulty, but I believe by the grace and power of God that Jesus can deliver me from those things. Do you believe that? If you believe that, why don't we stand together as we sing our closing song. As we think about God's power and his ability, the song that we're about to sing is, Tis So Sweet to Trust in Jesus. Do you believe that? My friends, trusting in ourselves brings anxiety. Trusting in Jesus brings peace and righteousness. Is there anyone here this morning who says, Lord Jesus, I want to walk with you. I want to trust you. Lord, I believe, but help my unbelief. Is that your desire this morning? Lord, I need that victory that only you can bring. And as we sing this song, can we sing it as a song of thanksgiving? As a song of praise, saying, Lord, whatever it is that I'm struggling with, I don't believe that'll separate me from you because I'm surrendering that this morning. Amen? And I'm going to accept that it's sweet to walk with Jesus. Let's sing together. Sweet to trust in Jesus Just to take Him at His word Just to rest upon His promise Just to know that says the Lord Jesus, Jesus, how I trust Him How I prove it all and all Jesus, Jesus, pray Jesus, all for grace to trust Him more. Oh, how sweet to trust in Jesus, just to trust the cleansing blood, just a simple faith to plunge me in the healing, cleansing blood. Jesus, Jesus, how I trust Him, how from sin and self to cease, just from Jesus simply taking life and rest and joy and peace. Jesus, Jesus, how I trust Him, how I praise Him more and more. Jesus, Jesus, precious Jesus, all for grace to trust Him. How many of you believe those words? You know, there might be someone here this morning who says, you know, I've never actually exercised trust in Jesus before. And there's a second line that might be unfamiliar to you, how I've proved him over and over. But is there anyone here who can testify to say that you've trusted Jesus before and he has proved himself trustworthy? Anyone? How many of you think we need to remember these things? And then the last line, oh, for grace to trust him more. My friends, it's what Jesus can do on our behalf, our faith in his ability that brings everything in its train. Do you believe that? 
the Spirit of God ministers to us as we exercise the faith in Christ. Maybe there's someone here this morning who says, Lord Jesus, there's a specific challenge I'm facing, and I need special prayer. If that's your desire, I just want to invite you to the front. No one knows what it is. We all face different challenges. But you say, Lord Jesus, I just want the prayers of my brothers and my sisters. I have a specific burden, I have a challenge, and I'm wrestling with you, but Lord, I just want to extend the hand of faith. That's why I'm coming forward this morning, and I'm extending the hand of fellowship, saying I, I want to be ministered to by my brothers and sisters. And my friends, as we come forward, Jesus sees us, amen? And even as we stand where we are, Jesus sees us. But there's some here who just says, Lord, I have this overwhelming, crushing feeling, whatever it is, but I don't want to leave that way today. I don't want to leave thinking that you're powerless to do the very thing that I need. I want to leave with an assurance of your ability. Amen? Amen. And so I'm praying, Lord Jesus, I believe, but help my unbelief. Let me ask you a question. Does God hear those prayers? Does he look into our situations? Does he tenderly care for each one of us? There are those coming forward and some who are wishing to or those who stay in their seats or reaching out the hand of faith and saying, Lord Jesus, I, I need a firmer grasp on you, amen? And I need you to just take a firmer grasp on me because my grasp is very weak, amen? Jesus, minister to me. Have mercy upon me. Father, Lord, we come this morning not for show, not for others, but simply because we need you. Father, you know our challenges. Some of us have wrestled with these challenges for years. And sometimes, like the man asking for healing of his son, we look at the longevity of our struggle and we don't see deliverance possible. Lord, we do believe. We believe that you are our loving Father. We believe that you're the all-powerful creator. You, we believe that you're the loving redeemer. Father, we believe that you have all ability. But Lord, help us where we don't believe. Father, we're claiming the promise of 1 John chapter 5. But this is the confidence that we have in you that if we ask anything according to your will, you do hear us. Father, the devil always steps in to remind us that maybe it's not a reality, but we extend the hand of faith again to believe that what we've come forward for or are standing for or is in our mind now, that you can give us deliverance from these things. Father, we pray that you would help us to walk in that victory. Lord, if we believe that you have delivered us, help us to live as though we believe that. Lord, may our faith turn into a divine cooperation of allowing divinity to work in our life. Father, we humble ourselves this morning. Lord, maybe even just now you're speaking to someone and there's someone who says, Lord, I need to recommit to you. Lord, you're calling me to either be baptized or rebaptized. Or maybe you're just calling me to study through what that means, to have a new journey with you. I, I don't even know where you're leading, but you're calling me to something deeper. Jesus tells us we need to be born of the water and the Spirit, and you say this morning, Lord, that's what I want. Maybe there's someone this morning who says, Lord, I'd like to prepare for baptism, new life in you, or rebaptism. I've fallen away, but I want it back. If that's your desire, while every head is bowed and every eye is closed, just lift your hand to heaven. Lord Jesus, I want to be baptized or rebaptized. God bless you, sister. The Lord knows where you're at. How many of you want to raise your hand and say, Jesus, I want a new walk with you. I want to accept that watery grave. God bless you, sister. God bless you, brother. God sees your hands. He knows your hearts. And we serve a faithful God. Father, we close our time of prayer with thanksgiving. 
Father, we've come burdened, but we believe in your ability. We've come maybe sorrowful, but we believe you're the comforter. We've come overwhelmed, but we believe you are all powerful. So Father, we submit our challenges into your hands. And Lord, we pray that you would remind us to do this moment by moment, day by day, hour by hour, that we could experience the blessings of heaven uninterrupted. In Christ's name we pray, amen. amen. I want to invite those of you who have made a decision for baptism or your baptism, just go ahead and come right up to this pew. As people leave, you don't have to do it as a public thing. Just come up. We'd like to have a quick word with you, pray together, and talk about preparing for that journey moving forward. So just slip to the front or slip off to the side, actually. Let's come off to the side. And for the rest of you, we will see you over in lunch soon.